good. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, so tomorrow we have our the second part of our uh, application uh, transfer application workshop, focusing on portfolio starting at six o'clock. We will start with a um, a guest speaker presenter who will talk about visual storytelling and how some of the things to consider when putting together your um, portfolio. And then we will follow that up with uh, individual breakout sessions with um, six of the local area, uh, local area schools, um, uh, architecture programs who then provide insight and, um, and reveal, not reveal, but um, let students know of the specific requirements for each of their individual portfolio reviews. Um, so that starts at six, and we anticipate that the first part of the presentation will go for about a half hour, and then the breakout sessions will start around 6.30. And then um, uh, the first half is actually open to all students um, because it's a uh, general information about putting together a portfolio, information that also can be transferred to doing just presentations. So I encourage everyone to, uh, from our school to attend uh, regardless of where you are in the transfer process. And then of course the breakout rooms will follow after that. And that's it. Okay, well, thanks a lot there, Mark. But everyone, in the program should know, but if, if you don't have this flyer, just contact you, one of your profs and they can give you this, which has the uh, URL because that is a virtual meeting. Um, next quick thing is our architecture club is having its first in-person official meeting ever since the beginning of the pandemic on this Friday um, at 4 p.m. So all of our students again should come to iTech 202, the main studio and lab, and there will be some ECC alumni there doing a little show and tell us all the projects they're working on. And plus it'll just give us a chance to see each other in person and see some things that people are working on. We'll actually have a special virtual guest with one of our uh, ECC alumni that is right now going to Cal Baptist and he'll talk about his transfer process where he started out at Woodbury and is now at uh, at Cal Baptist. But I think you'll really want to clue in and, and see that. So make sure you guys uh, come to that 4 p.m. on Friday. Um, the next event, really important one, and this is for really all design professionals, um, SoCal NOMA. So the Southern, Southern California chapter of the National Organization of Minority Architects is just in, endeavored into creating an exhibit, exhibiting our work. It's gonna be at the Helms Bakery in Culver City. And so perhaps I will put this flyer in the chat for any and all that have not seen it, but this will be an ongoing exhibit, free and open to the public that will feature the work of SoCal NOMA members, including the student chapters, and also some legacy projects of uh, uh, some of the founding architects of NOMA. Ironically, the organization has just celebrated its 50th year in existence, and the Southern California chapter began 40 years ago. So um, a lot of that work will be will be on display, um, like I said, from the 2nd through the 17th um, on Saturday, the 4th, 6 to 10 p.m., we're doing our first in-person holiday mixer since the pandemic has begun. So that event is uh, free to all uh, NOMA members uh, to come. And for uh, those that are not, uh, you can RSVP, everybody should RSVP, link is in here, or go to SoCalNumber.org. Non-members, it's $20, but you will uh, be able to mingle with uh, a lot of both the professionals and the NOMA students, because there will be NOMA students from all over coming to that event. And even yours truly will have something there in the exhibit. 
So um, if you can't make it to that date, know that the flyers states the times that the, the exhibit is open to the public to just come through free of uh, charge there. And the last thing I want to uh, share is um, the fact that on December 10th, which is the following Friday, this is hot off the press for all of our students. We're going to be touring uh, the new ECC football stadium. That's pretty new. It's been, a, been around about only three or four years. So the facility manager is going to take us on a tour through that, the back workings of that, the athletic training facilities, and also an aquatics center that was just completed at the beginning of this year that still hasn't been broken out. No one has used it yet due to the pandemic, but all of that is going to be our uh, walkthrough tour uh, free of charge. So if you are interested in touring that, I need an RSVP from you. So either put that in the chat or let me know um, on Friday during the architecture club meeting we're anticipating a group of maybe about two dozen, but let me know if you're interested in that. That is a free event really geared towards our students. So again, that's a lot of the architecture club things happening. We are planning to have some tours in the spring of some buildings under construction because Steve and Manzer, uh, there's a lot of construction going on on campus that's pretty cool. So we wanna make sure students start to see stuff, not when the building's all buttoned up, but see how it looks while it's under construction. And I've been working to try and get those tours going. So that is gonna happen in the, in the spring with uh, the help and coordination of some of your architecture club leaders, which I do wanna put a shout out here to uh, Eric Yu, which is our our NOMAS chapter president and Monica Rico, as well as I'm not sure if she, I'm sure she's here and just not on the screen. I'm looking at Abigail. Um, so we got a number, but we really look for the, for the other students to start to step in and help us with coordinating this and certainly participating in, in it. Okay, so I did that 611, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Without further ado, this was all important. I really wanted to get this out there while I have such a body of students, but did not want to take up more time than that because I'm just putting it out here right now in front. I've seen this lecture and as us folks in the field that have been pushed to go to lectures, going to USC, it wasn't an option. If you didn't show up, your instructor was looking at you saying, why weren't you there? You went to these. So I went to a ton. And I'm going to tell you right in front right now that this is in the top five lectures I've ever gone to. It's a quality lecture, let alone the building is great. But I think you guys are really going to enjoy this. So without further ado, I'm going to let uh, Steve Bain and Manzer Mercar uh, tell you a little about them and then a lot about the project. So take it away, gentlemen. Well, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, Manzer, you want to start or you want me to start? Yo. Go ahead, Steve. Okay. Um, my name is, is Steve Bain. Um, I'm a 1982 graduate of Hampton Institute, now Hampton University, uh, historically Black college in uh, Hampton, Virginia, um, for which I got a Bachelor of Architecture degree. I went on to University of Illinois, uh, Champaign-Urbana, and got a Master's in Architecture Management in uh, December of 83, I believe. Um, I've been with HKS for, I just had my sixth anniversary. Um, and I've, it's probably the best firm I've, I've been at throughout my career. Um, just the way they, they take care of people, the way they 
um, promote people and, and the, the projects that we are able to participate in. Um, SoFi, we were awarded SoFi probably three months after I was hired. I was hired to do a hotel on the Sunset Strip. And when we won the stadium, I really wanted to be on the stadium. And I was told that, well, we hired you for this hotel. So maybe once the hotel is complete, then we can shift you over to the, uh, to the stadium. And that's pretty much what happened. I, I'm mostly on the construction end. Um, Manzer is, was, more, was more in the design end. And um, so we're gonna kind of take you down the, the road that we that we mm -hmm. traveled on this adventure. Um, Manzer, you wanna? Sure. Yeah. Uh, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Manzer Merker. Uh, firstly, uh, I want to say, Ruben, you guys have an amazing program at, uh, with all those things coming. I feel like I'm missing out. There's some really great stuff, and you know, to the students, uh, take advantage of it. That, that, that's really amazing stuff. By the way, I was one of those students that was really lazy to go to those lectures. But, you know, uh, <laughs> every time I went to one, I never regretted it. It was like, I'm so glad I made up on my mind and showed up because I learned a lot. So, yeah, if, if you're sitting on the edge, uh, uh, go attend. Uh, there's some amazing stuff to learn over there. All right. So um, I graduated. Uh, I, I did my undergrad um, and graduated in uh 2000 and then uh, worked for a few years and then I did my master's in architecture from UCLA. Um, like Steve, uh, I've been here just over six years as well at HKS. Um, when I heard that HKS was going to be doing SoFi Stadium, I was like, I want to work on that project and I will try my best to get onto that team. And I was fortunate enough uh, that uh, I actually got that opportunity. Uh, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. It's an amazing project and I'm humbled uh, to be presenting it today. Um, you know, Steve and I are a uh, couple, two out of many, many, many architects, designers and a much larger extended team that uh, worked on this project. Uh, and hopefully we, we do justice to the project and we, we walk you through what this project is. It's a, it's a long presentation. We'll fit in in time. Uh, if time starts to run short, we'll try to kind of speed up towards the end, but it'll give you a good gist of what this project is. If you have any questions, um, type them in the chat. We'll try to address them towards the end of the lecture. My assumptions, you guys are generally familiar with architectural terminology, but if there's any specific uh, words, ter terminology that you're not familiar with, put in the chat. We'll, we'll, we'll address it uh, towards the end if possible. With that, I'll start sharing my screen, and I believe Steve is going to kick us off. Yes. And can I just jump in one second uh, to tell all of our ECC students to get any extra credit for this? You should put in the chat um, what class you're in. So just put the section and your name. Simple as that. Okay. Sorry for that. No problem. No right. problem. Give me one minute while I yeah. set up and, my and screen. And just while, while Manzer is bringing up the slides, um, one of the things about field visits, that was a requirement we had for a, a materials and methods class when I was an undergrad. That I probably learned more from that than I did in the classroom. So I would thoroughly encourage you to, to attend any field field visits while buildings are under construction because you'll you'll gain a better understanding of how things go together and you'll it, it, it's just really beneficial and, and like like Manzer said I, I I was reluctant to go to a lot of lectures and I didn't go to a lot of lectures in undergrad and I kind of kicked myself for not going so I encourage you to do that also All right, can you all see the screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay, uh, SoFi Stadium is, is a, a stadium and entertainment complex in Inglewood, California, as you all know, is located at the former site of Hollywood Park Racetrack, which opened in sep um, September of 2020. I'm sorry, the first event was held in May of 2020. 
Um, HKS was awarded the stadium in January of 2016. The groundbreaking was held uh, in November of 2016. And um, you all have, I'm sure, seen football games and maybe have attended concerts there. I know there's, there's a big event there tonight and also at the forum, which is causing a lot of congestion in the area. But anyway, uh, SoFi consists of a sta the stadium itself, um, a, pedest a pedestrian plaza, and the YouTube Performance Center. Uh, looking at the, the screen right now, uh, the stadium pole is to the left of the picture. The uh, plaza is between, more or less between the two most prominent columns. And the YouTube um, performance venue is the white area to the right. Uh, covering the stadium is a, is a fixed translucent e translucent ETFE roof, which covers the stadium proper and the adjacent pedestrian plaza. It also extends over the performance venue. The roof, the roof can also uh, project, project images that can be seen from airplanes flying into LAX and is supported independent, independently, a part of the stadium by a series of columns. The stadium bowl has size and seats 70,240 spectators for most events. With the ability to expand by 30,000 additional seats for larger events, the stadium and performance venue and performance center, I'm sorry, are considered to be separate facilities under one roof. Another component of the stadium design is the Oculus, an, an oval double sided 4K HDR video board that's, that's suspended over um, the field from the roof above. That structure alone weighs 2.2 million pounds and displays 80 million pixels. The Oculus also houses the stadium's 260 speaker audio system as well as a 56 5G wireless antenna. Uh, Manzer, can you skip to the next uh, slide? Sure. Uh, HKS. Um, was a design architect with Walter P. Moore, the structural engineer, Mia Lara, the landscape architect. Henderson uh, engineers were the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineers, and AECOM, Hunt, Turner were the contractors. The program was to, to house two NFL, uh, two NFL teams with a capacity of up to 100,000 people with flexible seating in a bowl, uh, multi-purpose capability, monumental indoor and outdoor room, and 6,000 seat performance venue. The regional reach of SoFi Stadium is roughly 150 miles out, as far north as Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, and Bakersfield, as far east as Palm Springs, and as far south as San Diego. The actual site is located in Inglewood, California, a block south of the famous, the fabulous forum on the old Hollywood Park racetrack site. Uh, that site opened originally in October of 1938 and closed in December, 2013. The objective was creating an authentic Los Angeles expression. From a, um, a global stage, an entertainment destination, indoor outdoor lifestyle, being a part of the region and an embedded object with layering. The stadium actually is three venues under one roof. SoFi Stadium, as I said to the left, the, the American Airlines Plaza in the middle, um, in the upper photo, the 
where the col columns um, you see running right to left or left to right. And the YouTube performance venue, which is a 6,000 um, seat arena. The stadium is located in the flight path of Los Angeles International Airport. And this factored into the stadium being sunk into the site by 100 feet in order to be out of the flight path of landing planes. In addition to the stadium, there is, is on-site parking and a park. It was decided early on to develop this site into a commercial retail, hospitality, residential, and park space. There will be stores, apartments, condominiums, hotels, etc. Uh, also on this site, um, more or less to the Southwest. Um, the NFL Network West Coast headquarters is also occupies the site uh, and was relocated from, from um, Culver City. All in all, this will be an entertainment hub similar to that around Staples Center, now the, the Crypto Center in downtown LA. All right, so I'm going to start jumping into a few details about the stadium and how we came up about the design. And as we progress through the, uh, uh, to the, through the presentation, we'll get into more and more detail, architectural detail about the, about the project. So uh, one of the first things we do, of course, you know, when we're designing something is what, what is this going to accommodate and what is it going to look like? We're going to talk about some of the design drivers, the concept behind the stadium and how we got to where we are with the form of the stadium. Um, the core of this whole project is of course uh, a stadium. It's the, the, the main component of which is a seating bowl. The client had given us the assignment to design a seating bowl that was for 70,000 people, but could be expanded to a capacity of 100,000 people. So we started there and designed uh, this uh, seating bowl. And for those of you don't know, who don't know, the, the whole design and architecture of a seating bowl within itself is a unique specialty within architecture because you have to consider sight lines from each and every seat uh, uh, that, you know, cover the entire field, making sure every seat has a good view. And then also inserting other programs into that bowl, depending on what the client's requirements are. So once you've designed a bowl, you kind of get an idea of what the mass of that stadium is going to look like. And so once we have this mass, we needed to put it onto the site and kind of place it and figure out how it was going to work. Uh, Steve mentioned that, you know, the, the site is right in between the two flight paths. And what that meant was the FAA had a requirement in terms of maximum height of a building. And we were exceeding that height by a lot because this stadium is big. And so what we had to do was dig a hole 100 feet deep and embed the stadium uh, into the ground. So it's interesting because when you see the stadium at scale, when you're approaching it, it's not a very heavy mass because a lot of that mass is actually embedded into the ground. Now, being in California, we, we also mentioned the, the, this whole indoor outdoor environment, the quality that we wanted to enjoy. But at the same time, we, we, didn't, we wanted to maintain the comfort for the patrons, for, uh, for the fans that are coming to watch the games. And so we, we, we had initially thought of having some kind of a roof. We wanted this to be kind of an indoor outdoor kind of open stadium, but we also wanted to make sure that it was shaded from the sun and the rain whenever we have that, which is extremely rare, but when it does happen. And so, um, you know, just kind of, we, we also talked about this whole stadium, this project being that of the region. And so that, you know, you see these influences into the form of, if you, if you weren't able to infer before, at least now when you look at the form, it, it becomes really obvious. You know, we took in inspiration from the coastline and from the, the ocean waves uh, and the surfing, you know, the whole surfing culture over here in uh, California. And then this notion of layering. And when we mean layering, it, it's supposed to kind of represent the, the multitude of layers of culture, the diversity of California, but kind of interpreted in a physical form. So, you know, you, you see the skin of the stadium, but you can also th see through the skin of the stadium to these multiple other layers. And now kind of going into the practicality, once you have a roof, well, you need to support that roof. So we br brought it down at four different corners and we'll talk about how we, we address that and how we design that. And then of course you need more columns 
And so you have these verticality of the columns that kind of come in that kind of subtle nod to the forum in terms of their verticality and that grid, vertical grid. Uh, and then ultimately we, we, we design a roof canopy or this uh, shaded roof and then we apply materials. And the two primary materials for this project were the metal panels and the ETFE roof. And we're gonna talk in more in detail in terms of why these materials and how about we went about the design and the execution of these, uh, of these projects, uh, of these materials. And then uh, because it's an indoor outdoor stadium, it gave us the opportunity to provide natural ventilation. Now, I mean, imagine a 100,000 seat stadium and you have to air condition it. That would be a lot of electrical cost and energy consumption. So this whole notion of uh, passive cooling, natural ventilation was really important to us. But again, like you, you have to keep in mind the winds up at the ground level and the bowl, the, the field itself is 100 feet down. So there was some... Uh, design that had to be done in terms of how do we ventilate, how do we bring, bring that wind down, and how do we make sure that uh, all seats have a comfortable temperature and that there is actual ventilation and move air movement that is going throughout the stadium. And we'll talk about that as well in, as we go through the design process. And then this whole programmatic synergy that uh, Steve already kind of talked about, there's this stadium on one end, there's the performance venue, the YouTube theater on the other, and then there's this public plaza in the middle. And all of these kind of either can work together, the, the systems that are designed, the uh, acoustic, or the electric systems, the sound system, uh, the operational design of the whole stadium is such that all three of them can work together to host one single event, or they can be separated out so that they can host individual events at the same time. And so here's an aerial photograph of what the design ultimately looks like. And uh, again, we'll be talking about the primary materials of ETFE, which is that translucent roof uh, up on top and the metal panels, which kind of form the edge uh, of, of, of that form. Here's another view. And this one's uh, looking from the west side. You see that we call these touchdown points. So this is one of the places where the roof kind of uh, comes down and touches the ground. And we have four places where this happens. And hopefully you can start to read the form of that ocean wave kind of curling around. And depending on where you're standing from, you get a different interpretation of that uh, canopy as you walk around it. Uh, here's another touchdown point. This is at the uh, um, south end. And this is closer to YouTube theater and you can kind of see that stadium kind of coming in. And towards the right, you kind of see the spline curve that kind of represents that coastline. And again, kind of embedding, uh, you know, taking inspiration from uh, Californian features. Um, one thing unique to this project is that um, it has this thing that we call the fifth elevation. Uh, you know, roofs on buildings are usually not designed uh, they're usually an afterthought because nobody's going to be seeing them. Well, in our case, the roof is one of the most important elevations on that facade because when airplanes come down, we're really close and intimate to that roof. And it was an opportunity to kind of represent Los Angeles and kind of make this as a marker or a gateway to the city. Um, and what I mean by that is you can start to see kind of uh, the effects we can have in terms of the ambience and, and, and the way the, the project is represented. Uh, on the top center image, that's actually an image looking towards the ocean. Unfortunately, we've got the marine layer and low cloud cover kind of covering it, but that's where the uh, runways are as well. And you can kind of see the uh, video board kind of giving this ambience, but we didn't stop there, of course, right? So we re really wanted to take advantage of that uh, fifth elevation. So we've got, um, a whole LED light matrix up on top that can project video um, and represent either the game that's going uh, going on below or represent major events going on or can also be used as a ad background. But then again, like the whole intent was to make this as a marker, a gateway into Los Angeles. And, you know, it's it's just not missable. It's right there when you fly in. And very quickly kind of going, so we're at that 100 feet down level and kind of just looking at the architecture, just to give you guys an idea of what a stadium looks like, right? It's a seating bowl, but there's a lot of other program that kind of goes around it and builds up. And now we're coming up to the ground level, which is 100 feet up. And then we still keep building up and up to the upper levels of the stadium. 
and building up that infrastructure, those multiple layers of seats and kind of come up all the way to the uh, top level. And then there's all these other programs around it. There's concession stands, restrooms, uh, shopping units, all of that kind of stuff. And all of this is ultimately covered by this metal panel and uh, ETFE roof. I'll have Steve kind of take it off and kind of explain the shell a lot more in detail. So the, the overall uh, canopy or roof structure of the stadium consists of metal, metal triangles perforated to allow sunlight to pass through, but not being overly bearing on the occupants. These triangles are attached to these two frames and the perforation was introduced to add texture. Then go on to the next one. There we go. Uh, this was this was done through sizing and spacing. We ended up with a solid looking structure from a distance, with some texture introduced as a at, at a medium distance, and then the actual perforation as you get uh, up at, at close distance. You want me to keep going, Steve? Yeah, keep going. I think, uh, are you at 40 yet? Uh, yeah, uh, slide 40 is right here. Okay. So the, the perforations added light texture to the shadow it, it casts. In order to, to uh, value engineer or reduce the cost, uh, panel fabrication optimization was introduced and we began with 37,536 Tristin panels. And that number was then reduced to 35,206, reducing the number of panels by 6%. Uh, the panels are, are triangular in shape. And what is illustrated here is the grid pattern to locate the, the perforations. Additionally, please note the three attached points there are three attachment points for each panel. I think you were, we're behind a couple of slides. Just gonna go through them. Oh, there we are. So the attachment detail uh, of how, this illustrates an attachment detail of how the panels are attached to the frame. And then these are uh, the panels pre-assembled and um, attached to the, the actual structure and loaded onto the, uh, the stadium framework. Again, this is that, that same touchdown point that uh, Manzer illustrated earlier. It's a different time of day. So the coloration is a little different. This is at dusk uh, looking west. This is at the southeast corner. I'm sorry, southwest corner. This is the flip side of that previous slide. And then looking north. I don't know if you saw that plane flying through. So you see the, the shadow that, that is cast 
and the, the patterns that are uh, illuminated through those panels. The whole idea with the uh, with the metal panel was to kind of keep it light, um, and like Steve mentioned, for it to be solid when you were far farther away, and as you came close, you kind of saw the perforations and became light, and then that kind of transitioned into the ETFE enclosure all the way on the top. So I am not even going to try and attempt what ETFE completely stands for but of course it's a it's a form of uh, clear plastic uh, that has these qualities of you know transparency uh, it is lightweight and it, one of the more important things from an architectural standpoint it is non-combustible um, it can hold uh, it's more free form so it can hold uh, very organic forms um, because it's lightweight and it doesn't have a lot of weight, you don't need a lot of structure to hold it up. And that's why the actual roof structure itself can be light and a long span. And when a roof structure is light, it also means a reduction of cost. And then uh, because it's lightweight, it can be moved around and we'll, we'll talk about how we're moving these around, but moved around to make these openings so that they can provide ventilation. And then of course, um, we didn't want the solid roof on top. We, we still wanted that feel of an open air uh, stadium. So the ETFE allows us that transparency and the ability to, for light to kind of come through, uh, uh, come through the, the material. Now, this is another view of what that ETFE roof looks like. You'll see that the pattern is not very, uh, the, the grid is regular, but the, the shape and the surface of the ETFE itself is, a little uh, subtly different as it moves along that whole uh, space. Wherever you see these kind of white horizontal lines or a little more texture is panels that can actually move. They're operable panels, so they can actually slide open uh, to allow for that ventilation. And then if you look towards the center of the ETFE roof, you'll see that some of those panels are actually sloped. And that's because the general geometry of the shell roof the way the structure behaves is, and the, the way the structure is designed, it tends to become flat towards the top. And when it's flat, it doesn't allow for drainage. So we had to kind of reshape some of these ETFE panels to help with the drainage of water so that it would be able to all drain off that roof. And by the way, all of that water is collected and routed into that lake you see on, uh, next to it uh, and then recycled. And that same water can be used again for watering the landscape that's on the site. So uh, definitely sustainable from that uh, standpoint. Um, the, the panels themselves are, are organized in this very regular 60 foot by 60 foot grid. Um, you know, it's around a million <laughs> square feet of ETFE. Um, doesn't look really large unless you, uh, unless you really kind of zoom in and kind of compare the scale. And so this is what a 60 foot by 60 foot panel looks like, definitely larger than my house. Um, and so there's several of these 60 feet by 60 feet panels that kind of span all, all the way across uh, and form this ETFE uh, semi-transparent, translucent roof. Um, I was talking about the ventilation and the importance of natural ventilation and designing for winds to kind of uh, provide that ventilation. And so here's a system that we developed along with our uh, engineers in terms of providing that ventilation. So the, on the left, top left, the blue, the, blue, the blue squares you see are the panels that are operable. They can slide open uh, either manually, manually meaning either at a push of a button or based on a predetermined program to allow for that ventilation, to allow for that hot air that's risen and started accumulating underneath that roof to kind of went out. And of course, when that went out, there's this low pressure zone um, that's created underneath, which allows the surrounding cooler air to get sucked into the stadium. And so that's in a very basic form. That's, that's the whole concept behind this whole passive cooling system to, um, to the stadium. Um, and then uh, in terms of that pre-programming uh, of the system, here again with our engineers, we developed this whole program uh, that would uh, take into account many different criteria, wind speed, 
uh, air quality, uh, is there a game in progress, all of those things and determine which panels need to be open, which can remain closed um, and uh, kind of provide that ventilation, a regulated uh, temperature control in some ways to that roof. Here's a um, rare, never before seen of the uh, panels opening up. It's sped up, of course, the panels open a little more slowly than this, but those are the uh, 60 foot panels. They're divided into halves. So that's a 30 by 60 feet panel that slides open and two halves kind of open up to give that 60 foot by 60 foot opening uh, to, to that roof. Here's another quick view of those panels that are kind of sliding open. And then architecture is not only about design, there's a lot of other considerations that need to take place uh, while we're doing this. And so you see this graded catwalk that the per people are standing on and that's for access. So it, the ETFE um, membrane itself is designed to take weight, but of course for access and maintenance, uh, we have these catwalks that allow you to kind of walk in if, if maintenance is needed. And now very quickly, I'm gonna to touch on uh, the, the heart of this whole project, which is the bowl itself. And we'll touch on that uh, infinity board, video board, uh, the, the formal name of which is the infinity board. We lovingly used to call it the Oculus. Um, so uh, again, like I talked earlier about, you know, the, the, the architecture of a seating bowl in itself is a specialty in terms of how it is designed. And when you look at this, of course, the stadium is designed for NFL games, but what you don't see here is that the stadium can be modified and transformed to accommodate um, soccer games, monster truck uh, shows, uh, uh, music concerts, which I don't know if any, if any of you went to the Dead Mouse or the Cascade concert, but, uh, or seen it uh, on YouTube, but uh, a host of other things. And not one solution fits all. So the configuration of all of these has to be changed depending on what it is. So uh, a lesser known fact is some of these lower seats are actually dismantleable and they can be uh, dismantled to create a larger area for uh, uh, soccer or other requirements that are requ uh, uh, depending on what is needed. Um, the bowl, again, as you can see, is not a continuous surface because of course there's multiple levels and those levels are broken by these uh, decks that are called suites. So these are kind of like rooms that have seats in front. Uh, and so you can kind of hang out in the room and then come out into your seat and kind of watch the game. And then of course, behind that is all the concession stands and the support spaces. And uh, personally for me, some of the best seats actually in this stadium are the ones in the top. And another interesting fact about this uh, stadium design is if you see the slopes of the seats towards the bottom, you'll see that they're really, really shallow. Uh, the seats all the way at the top deck, at the top level are really raked up. And that's to kind of make sure that the person that's even all, all the way on the top is still closer to the action than a typical seating bowl would be. So it's a more, any, anybody who's watched a game and kind of been in the stadium and no stadiums would, would tell you, that it's a more intimate stadium. It's so large, but still it keeps, brings you closer to the action than uh, a typical stadium or a seating bowl would. Here's a quick walkthrough of when you come out onto the field and what that looks like. Uh, take note of that video board up top. And I'll talk more in detail soon about that video board. And of course that translucent ETFE roof all the way up there, each panel 60 feet by 60 feet. Here's another panoramic view. There's the video board and the seating levels. By the way, the top floor is up there where it says SoFi Stadium. That's actually the ground level. And then the rest of it is down below ground. Another panoramic view kind of panning all the way again towards that end zone and then panning back around. So that's what players would see when they're out on the field. Uh, very quickly, a little bit about the infinity board. This is one of a kind, very unique board uh, design. Usually in sports architecture, uh, video boards are common, but uh, either they're hung, you'll see a flat screen board that's hung right from the center, or you'd see a board that is actually at the behind the bowl 
tuck behind the bowl. Um, and so what we wanted to do on this project was create a very unique experience and provide a, a, a view, not only of the field, but even of the video board uh, for people to really enjoy. I mean, uh, interest, not an interesting fact, it should be actually really obvious, but um, people usually spend more time, if not equal time watching the video board uh, in comparison to watching the actual gameplay on the field, because a lot of the event actually involves uh, replays, and other information and stats on the board. So that video board becomes really important to the experience. And we wanted to create an experience where um, it wasn't some tiny piece of information on this video board tucked in one corner. We wanted it front and center. So we approached it with this idea of a living room experience. And so over here you, in the diagram, you see what a person sitting in the living room, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> watching a, typical you know uh, television is experiencing and that viewing angle uh, ideal viewing angle for that is somewhere between 9 and 15 degrees uh, and what we wanted to do was extrapolate that and project it for the video board so what happens is once you start pulling this person behind as you go farther and farther away from the screen the screen starts to become bigger and that's the whole idea between the way this video board is designed and the, the, the intent is that the people who are sitting down here are actually looking at the far side of the video board. And that's why that screen is actually taller, if you noticed. Uh, the people who are sitting in the mid decks and the upper decks are probably going to be looking at the outside screen. And that screen, because it's closer, doesn't need to be so tall. And it's actually shorter than the uh, inside video board. By the way, this whole video board, Oculus, Infinity Board, as we call it, is 45 feet high, which is almost four stories tall. Uh, Steve mentioned it's 2.2 million pounds. So you can imagine it's literally a building that is hanging from the, from the roof. Um, here's a quick I'll just let this run for a second. All right. So another interesting thing about that video board is it is NFL's first 4K resolution video board. And the video quality uh, is almost like you're watching something on your own television. Now, when you're designing something like this, it looks really simple. But the, the whole intent behind this is to, um, uh, to simplify it anyways, because of the complexities of it. I mean, come on, 2.2 2 million pounds hanging from the roof. We don't want more complexity. We want to simplify it as much as possible. So. Uh, in terms of its design, it's complex, but in terms of its execution and geometry, it's really simple. It's literally just two radii, uh, one large radii that blends into the smaller radii to kind of form that oval. If you haven't noticed yet, it's ingeniously sized that it fits right dead center inside of that extents of the field. And the way it was designed is literally we left 10 feet from each side so that there was access while it was in construction. And that's how big we made it. In fact, interesting fact, the Oculus was actually much larger during the initial design phases. And uh, as we were designing this and collaborating on this, we, we came to the point where, all right, now we got to execute this. How are we going to erect it? How are we going to design it? How are we going to build this up? And one of the issues we came up with, well, if it's bigger than the seating bowl, we're gonna to have to create this fake platform on which we have to build this and then raise it up. And that was of course not gonna happen. And so we scaled it to be the largest possible video board within that footprint of the field. So next time or whenever you're up there, out there or if you see it on TV, here's a fun fact, that, that video board, you bring it down, it's gonna fit on the field just barely. And again, coming to the complexity, you know, it's just two radii, but all the complexity in the form is uh, all embedded into one corner. And what that allows us to do is 
design this, document this, draw this, um, engineer this, and build this really simply for all the other components, and then really concentrate on the complexity only on one corner. And that, uh, you know, reduction in time, reduction in cost, uh, and just uh, easier execution of the project. And these are things that, of course, as an architect, you have to keep in mind in the back of your head. Complexity where it's needed and simplify where, 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 you, don't need, uh, where you don't need that complexity. Um, just some few snapshots of drawings. Of course, uh, another unique thing about this project is uh, not unique, actually. It's where it's it's become more and more typical nowadays. Is that the projects are delivered uh, not only as two D drawings but as three D models as well. So, but we still have to document two D drawings. So th these are some of the two D drawings that describe some of the three D models that are part of the package, and then you know just some random drawings from uh, from uh, from the set. So some of this is Revit, some of this is Rhino for those of you who are familiar with software. And some of this is also Grasshopper. Uh, if, if you don't Google it, it's an interesting software as architects. It's, it's something that's up and coming and is a useful tool. And then of course, this system, this Oculus that we're designing has to be coordinated with all the other nuts and bolts and systems that they're inside. So here you see kind of speaker areas that are tucked in, but not only that, they have to be maintained. So you have to design access to all of these and make sure all of that can be um, maintained. Uh, some more drawings and I'll wrap this up very quickly. Uh, we're kind of coming towards the end. There's, there's a few more topics that we're gonna address. One important topic I did wanna address was uh, seismic design. Uh, and earthquakes. There's a major fault line that actually goes really, really close to the site, the Newport Inglewood fault line. And that makes things that much more complicated for us in terms of design of, uh, of, of, of the stadium. Of course, it has to be seismically designed. Um, so the approach to this uh, in collaboration with our structural engineers was to isolate this bowl uh, completely from the earth surrounding it. So this is the earth that comes out to it. And there's this big hole, uh, cavity, that's wrapped around in a whole ring all the way around the bowl. So literally, this bowl does not touch the surrounding earth. And that's intentional. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain soon why. Um, so let's say an earthquake does happen. Uh, what happens is that the bowl is completely separated not only from the surrounding earth, but it's actually separated from the roof as well. And what that allows us to do is the bowl would actually move individually. It allows it to move individually uh, and not be impacted by the surrounding earth, uh, which helps with the seismic design, uh, seismic performance. And then the roof itself actually, interestingly enough, doesn't touch the bowl anywhere, not at all. And uh, that allows the roof to kind of move separately either. By the way, the roof is also separated from the ground and I'll show you how that is done. Here's a quick uh, just rendering video that shows some of these structural systems. Those are the columns. These dots that you see are called isolators and I'll talk about them very shortly right now. And then the whole roof is sitting on these isolators. And of course that roof carries the ETFE and metal panel system. So the entire roof is sitting on those magenta dots that you saw. And uh, those are isolators. And what those do is they isolate the movement of the roof from the ground. And how's that done? Here's a video of what that isolator looks like. Um, those yellow slabs, you can imagine the bottom yellow slab as a column and the top yellow slab as a roof. And the blue gray uh, disc that you see in the middle is the isolator. And this is how it works. In, 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 if there is an earthquake, your ground is going to shake. But what happens to the roof is it kind of stays in position. And so each and every column on that roof, supporting that roof has this isolator at the top that allows that roof to kind of be stable in, an, uh, in, in a seismic event. And not only are the columns supported by those isolators, we, we talked about those touchdown points, the four touchdown points. So that black disc right, right there is also a seismic isolator. So anytime a roof structure comes to the ground, which is those four corners, we have a seismic isolator, that cavity over there is to allow for that movement five feet in any direction. 
you see this kind of black sliver at the top of the column in the left image. That is a seismic isolator. And the right image kind of shows you a close up of what that seismic isolator looks like. And so that's how we address the seismic design on this project. Again, in the engineering uh, unique uh, solution. Now we're gonna go into um, landscape design around the site and I'll have Steve kind of talk about that. All right. Uh, landscaping is a, a very important aspect of, of the design of any building. You, you might not think about landscaping in any, you know, um, architectural design, but it, it plays an important, important role um, the overall, for the overall structure and your experience. Uh, it adds color and it provides a cooling effect to any project. One does not not want to look out from such a beautiful structure and just see an asphalt parking lot. Here, the landscape plan is illustrated the green areas around the project. Area one identifies the stadium for which there are, are areas in the plaza and canyons that are landscaped. Area two is the lake and its immediate surrounding area. Area three is the arroyo or river and area four is the park. So those, um, those illustrations to the right kind of illustrate the, the, the four areas that I discussed. Uh, number one is the, the stadium, two is the lake, three is the arroyo and four is the park. Go, okay, there you go. Uh, the landscaping is meant to provide a park-like feel throughout the development. In addition, please notice that the patterns in the hardscape paving immediately around the stadium giving the hardscape a flowing feeling. So the, uh, the asphalt or the, the uh, patterns directly outside the stadium kind of give you a, a flowing effect. Additionally, you'll notice the trees and the containers are strategically placed in the parking lot. These are not permanent as portions of the parking lot will be a part of more development on the site. So if you, you look out in the parking lot, you'll see the, the, where the, the various trees are, um, where Manzer's cursor is going. Those are, they're in boxes and they're, they're not permanent. Um, their plans for this parking lot in, in, in the future. So the water retention strategy, um, I need to define a few things for you guys. Um, a 25 year, 24 hour storm means a storm of, 24, of a 24 hour duration, which yields a total rainfall of a magnitude, which is probably reoccurring once every 25 years. A 50 year storm refers to a storm that is 2%, has a 2% chance of occurring on any given year. It usually refers to, rain, to uh, rainfall events. A 100 year storm means that there is a one in 100 or 1% 1 chance that a storm will reach this intensity in any given year. The stadium acts as a watershed, meaning when it rains, the rain hits the structure, then travels to the ground, and then is captured in the lake. Same with the arroyo. Rain hits the ground, the site is sloped with the intention of, it, of this rainwater flowing towards the lake for retention. This retained water also cools the site by not being a hard surface and evaporating into the air. The water is then used to partially water the surrounding environment. The lake is, is designed to accommodate a 25 year storm and be maintained and to be maintained within the confines of the lake. If a 50 year event hits, the water then overflows to the underground pipes, which are in um, are placed in, in at Century Boulevard storm drain. If we get a hundred year storm and the, the water goes out to Century Boulevard storm drain and over, over land to uh, Prairie Avenue. Here is a video of the, the lake 
uh, kind of a walk around the lake. The lake has, has waterfalls and, and uh, split level as you get closer to the, uh, to the stadium. And that waterfall is not flowing and the seagulls tend to congregate. It's kind of a sight to see. Uh, next, there you go. This is the, uh, the Southwest landscape, uh, adjacent walkway. That's the, uh, the YouTube um, theater uh, to the left as it was under construction. This is the Arroyo landscape. So we're <clears throat> the landscape of the Arroyo. This is a touchdown point uh, at the northeast on the back side of the video. Uh, I'm sorry, the YouTube theater. And that arroyo is, is going to run from the lake up to the park, which has not yet been uh, fully developed. So all this is a uh, is a dry riverbed basically, and you know when it rains, then it'll be a flowing a flowing river. Pretty long video. Yeah, should I skip to the next one? <laughs> yeah. Oops, there we go. So this is an aerial, obviously an aerial photo. Um, the NFL Network building is in the foreground at the bottom. Um, you can see the landscaping between the NFL Network building and the stadium. To the that's to the west of the stadium. The lake is to the southwest. Um, and you really can't see the east side, but you get a, a feel for it. Uh, you can see the, the four touchdown points. If you can point those out, um, Anzer, that's the, the northeast, that's the northwest, mm -hmm. the southwest, and that's the northeast. So these uh, to the left are the canyon views. Oh, to the left is the canyon view to the east. Um, there's a canyon view to the west, and then there's one at the north. And what these are, they step down into the stadium, uh, but they provide you uh, landscaping. And I'll get into you know the the whys and what fors of the landscaping as uh, we move forward. This is the uh, the West Canyon as it steps down. <clears throat> so um, I'm not a, a landscape architect, um, but I have an explanation for what the whys and what for is here. So uh, we have contextual contextual 
regionalism. So the Los Angeles Basin and more so the Southern California region, region consists of a number of varying climates. The Los Angeles Basin is primarily a desert. You have an ocean and the beach to the west, the mountains to the east, and the stadium. The, north, the northwest symbolizes the desert. At the stadium, sorry, at the stadium. The northwest symbolizes the desert. The west side symbolizes the upper montane. Think about Big Bear Lake, a place like Big Bear Lake. The southwest of the lake is the riparian zone, rocky streams as they have in say some place like Santa Barbara. Um, <clears throat> to the southeast is a chaparral symbolizing the Santa Monica Mountains. And to the northeast, the lower montane, think of uh, Angeles National Forest. <clears throat> so a desert is a barren area of landscape where little participation precipitation occurs, and consequently, the living conditions are hostile for plant and animal life. Lack of vegetation ex exposes the unprotected surfaces of the ground to the processes of the denun denunciation. Montane is relating to growing in or being biogeographically zone of relatively moist, cool upslopes below timberland dominated by large con I'm sorry, con furious trees. Chaparral is a coastal biome with hot, dry summers and mild, rainy winters. Chaparral areas receive about 38 to 100 centimeters of participation a year. This makes the chaparral mostly vulnerable to fire in the late summers and fall. Riparian areas supply food, cover, and water for large diversity of animals and service migration routes and stopping points between habitats for a variety of wildlife. Trees and grasses in riparian areas stabilize stream banks and reduce flood water velocity, resulting in reduced downstream flood peaks. Riparian areas supply food, cover, and water for a large, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, next slide. So this is the, uh, the lake aerial view. You see to the upper left is the, the step downs or where the waterfalls are. The Southwest approach is a mostly desert looking um, area. So the Champions Walkway, this is between um, the NFL Network and the stadium. It's the same area with the, from a different angle. walking north. Now we're walking south. That's over to the uh, one of the canyons. This is the northwest uh, and in between the stadium and um, Forum. That uh, southwest touchdown point. I'm sorry. It's north West touchdown point. This is the uh, Champions Walkway, which we kind of just went through. This is the Southwest uh, Champions view, the NFL network in the background. more or less the same area at the, from a different angle. 
this is looking down into the canyon <clears throat> from that same um, west west portion. This is coming from the north, heading south from uh, from the forum area. Sorry, that's a jittery video. And this is coming from the from the west as you approach uh, American Airlines Plaza. This captures the, the desert feel. Okay, <clears throat> we're towards the end of the presentation now. We'll touch a little bit on the American Airlines Plaza, this public space that we're talking about between the stadium and the performance venue. And then we'll quickly talk about uh, the performance venue, which is also known as the YouTube theater. Um, so early on in the stages of design, uh, one of the components that the client asked us to do was create this space for public. And the whole intent behind that was, we didn't want this to be a stadium where you came to watch a football game, which sounds ironic, right? Um, the intent was that you want this to be a place where everybody can enjoy, uh, that there's something for everyone to do. And uh, we, we weren't able to touch on every nuance, but even within the stadium, if, if uh, the design of the stadium is approached from a perspective of, even if you weren't an NFL fan, even if you weren't there to watch a football game, you could still have uh, fun in, in that seating bowl. There was still stuff to do and things to do and spaces to enjoy, even for non-fans. And that kind of same theme kind of repeats outside as well to kind of provide this um, public space for the community for all of us, you could walk there and it's open, generally open unless it's uh, scheduled for an event. Uh, this is a space where you can walk up to and kind of enjoy. Uh, the intent is that there would be maybe food carts and events or some other things are going on in this uh, kind of uh, open plaza, but still covered from, uh, from the sun above and from the rain. And generally the roof is designed that the temperatures underneath uh, because of the ETFE roof would be much more tolerable than when you would be standing in the direct sun. And again, kind of uh, the the grade uh, the grade is kind of uh, approached with, with these kind of steps and ramps that kind of go across. Of course, as an architect, you also have to design for, um, uh, it has to be a universal design. It has to be inclusive. So you have to make sure that this design is accessible for people on wheelchairs, for people with disabilities. So all of that kind of, there's there's meandering ramps that kind of take you up as well. Um, and then of course, uh, Steve mentioned the whole like uh, pa paving pattern that is inspired by the landscape and kind of blends in uh, into the ground and then kind of taking access to the stadium on on the left and you can see that you know the stadium's high up on the roof but at the ground level you're almost at the level of the oculus and then you know you come in and it's one of those rare stadiums where you actually go down into your seat or walk just maybe one level up to get to your seat but you don't have to walk multiple stairs to get to your uh to your seats um and then of course there's a performance venue on the right here's kind of just a walk the American Airlines Plaza, you see that ETFE roof, all of those squares are 60 feet by 60 feet. And then you see this performance when you uh, YouTube theater that's been embedded into that south corner of the site. Here's another view kind of walking through up those ramps. And then as you walk, there's these water bodies that kind of um, meander across these bridges and kind of flow down and then of course go and connect into that major main lake. So stadium, looking back west towards the stadium. Uh, 
and then turning towards the performance menu. Here's another one up top. This top level of the water body actually has uh, water fountains on it uh, and not far up yet, but they, the water jets are designed to kind of reach all, almost all the way to the underside of the roof. Uh, and very quickly, the performance when you, this is, uh, this is the YouTube theater. It's designed uh, to have multi-use, mul uh, multiple uses. It's uh, 6,000 seats, so it gives this alternate um, venue for people who want a smaller, more intimate space. Um, the whole design of the performance venue kind of reflects that whole stadium design intent as well. The embedded object, this, the performance venue itself is also kind of buried into the ground uh, to kind of accommodate those 6,000 seats and kind of nestles into this corner of, of, of underneath the roof. An interesting fact is that the Performance venue was treated as a somewhat a separate project than the stadium, uh, just because of scheduling issues. And so the stadium started construction before the performance venue. And by the time the performance venue construction started, the roof was already in place. So whenever we address the uh, YouTube theater performance venue, we always say that we had to construct it as if we were constructing a ship inside of a bottle because of the logistics of how do you design or erect a building underneath a roof. Um, here's just a cutaway section showing the multiple levels. Uh, there's a level below, um, and then uh, there's the uh, plaza level, and then a balcony level that has an exterior terrace uh, that you can walk into. Uh, and another interesting thing about this performance when you facade is that this uh, glass facade is a glass fin curtain wall. It is sloped at six degrees, and I believe it is... Uh, uh, one of the very few sloped glass fin facades uh, ever to be built. Um, again, kind of addressing, you know, the multi-function uh, nature of the of the uh, space. It can be used to host shows, award shows, um, esports. Um, uh, Stan Kroenke, who is the owner of the Rams, also owns an esports uh, 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 setup. And so the whole notion was that it could host esports games as well, and of course, uh, music concerts uh, and other events as well. And so here's just a view of the performance venue when it was under construction. It is now completed and looks uh, pretty uh, much more completed. Uh, and then here's an approach from the stadium walking towards that um, YouTube theater performance venue. There's a rendering. Um, and again, that performance when you tucks in right underneath the stadium roof. Another photograph from the West. Just a panorama to wrap things up very quickly. And that facade is uh, made of plaster. And that's the whole stadium with the plaza and the performance venue. Um, and that's it, that's, uh, that's our stadium, uh, home of the Rams and the Chargers. Thank you very much. Awesome, awesome presentation thank, there. Thank you all. So, hey, we'll, we'll move to the Q and A of things. So I, I saw a couple of questions. I want students to and others to formulate questions you may you may have. Um, although Steve answered one of them that was put in the chat about who did the um, well no, he answered my question. Well I, I answered two questions actually. Uh, Mia Lara and, uh, handled the the landscape design and then the Potted plants in the parking lot will be moved elsewhere on the site if they can be used or then uh, moved elsewhere if they can't. And another question, Eric, you had is I'm still rather new to understanding materials. I had to look up the ETFE, but of course, super fascinating. Uh, he's asking, um, I wonder what accommodations had to be made for its applications on the roof? Also, the second question, separate one is, 
uh, how was the Oculus put together? Was it all put together on site on the ground and erected up or was it some of it transported there? I'll take the ETFE question and then I believe uh, Steve can answer the Oculus one. So uh, ETFE is a common material in architecture nowadays. Um, it's, it's designed not to be punctured. Uh, there's two types of ETFE systems that are used in architecture. One is called a pillow, and it's called a pillow because it's literally that. There's two layers of ETFE that are filled with air. And uh, when that one is punctured, of course, you know, uh, the air loosens out and you have to uh, kind of repair it. Um, and uh, there's a more pressure on that system because it's pillowed. But what the pillow system does is it gives you more um, insulation because of air inside, but it also gives you more uh, form. Uh, on, in our case, the system that we have is a single layer ETFE. And the way that one is supported is, is different. It's supported with uh, cables. And uh, the, the, the puncturing of the ETFE re re really depends on the mill or the thickness of the ETFE. And uh, the thickness of this ETFE is designed literally along with the cables to kind of support a person's weight. So you can, you can imagine how thick the ETFE is. In case it does get punctured, yes, you have to replace it or patch it up. It can be patched. You don't have to replace the whole, uh, whole uh, piece. And yeah, those... there were there were a number of places because I, I inspected the roof um, during the punch process and there were areas that had to be patched. I mean, they were they were minor uh, patches, you know, maybe an inch by an inch, um, but it, it can be patched and you you really can hardly notice it if you're up close. I mean, you're not going to you're obviously not going to see it from from your seat. Um, but you, you can see it when you're up close. And remind me um, about how big were the, are the panels themselves, the triangular pattern patterns, panels that you showed are about how big? Are the ETFE panels, Ruby? Mm -hmm. They're 60 feet by 60 feet. Oh, uh, okay. But the, the, so what the roof is mainly made of those little triangular pieces all you, coming together right how big are those so the metal panels each triangle was designed so that the every edge would not be or would be close to four feet that was a parameter that was defined onto it so each panel is close to four feet by four feet by four feet uh, it, but it's not an equilateral triangle every panel is different okay and then with regard to the Oculus, that was all uh, assembled on the, on the ground, uh, on, the, on the field, basically, and then uh, lifted into place over, was it like two days? It took to lift into place. There's a video, is that video on YouTube? Um, there is a time-lapse video that shows the lifting of the Oculus on YouTube. Yeah, it took like two days to lift it. Okay, so there's another question by Javier. I know that ventilation and natural cooling is controlled through the operable roof panels, but with this being an open plan, is there a way to control the heating of the stadium if it were to get too cold? If uh, yes, and is it as simple as leaving the panels on the roof shut? Well, good question. Um, uh, Fortunately, being California, we don't have to worry too much about uh, it being cold. And uh, generally speaking, it's more focused on cooling. Uh, in terms of uh, how to keep it warm, there's no actually engineered design system to keep it warm. The expectation is um, if you are in an event during the evening and because of the amount of people there, in, uh, there during the event, generally it's going to be warm or not warm, but tolerably, uh, tolerable, let's say, sufficient enough. I mean, and again, I mean, you know, the intent behind the stadium is um, that it be an outdoor environment, um, that you would not feel any different than you were standing outside, although there have been made uh, efforts made for the comfort to be better than you were standing exposed to the elements. Um, and- uh, In terms of shading. In terms of shading. And one of the largest benefits of having this indoor outdoor stadium is, is, is the, uh, 
uh, uh, reduction in energy consumption, let's say in, in terms of cooling a stadium. Yep, so, so for, the, for the West Coast people, we, we may use the word coal quite loosely. If you're an NFL fan and you watch a Denver Bronco game or a Green Bay Packer game, like now, let alone in December, uh, what we have going on looks like the tropics <laughs> at any given time. That, that, that's no joke. I was back east a couple of weekends ago and it went from, from 80 degrees to like 40 in, in the span of overnight. Yeah. And so I it, realize why I don't live back there. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't think I see any other um, questions. It was funny. I, I kind of uh, fancy myself a little bit as a architectural photographer. I've always thought of if I didn't do architecture, that would have been the other life was doing architectural photography. So I just want to share a couple of photos that I took because I did go to the stadium for the uh, Rams uh, opening training day, mainly to see that <laughs> was the stadium. And let me see if I find it was only about four or five pictures here that I think you may think are pretty cool. This is that plaza level entry level. Um, this is being down at that level that that's in the in the west canyon yes and you really see those columns and blades and the experience of that's why it's such a unique stadium that you're you're in the stadium if you will but you're outdoors and experiencing that uh this is one of the concession stands still not open that day because this was literally the first training day but it was kind of cool to ooh and ah and like what the interiors would look like in a place yeah, like that, that. That's one of the convenience uh, markets. Uh-huh. And a really good shot of what it felt like sitting in a seat in there and experiencing the Oculus, seeing panels those are open. Uh, panels are open, which it was really great to see your presentation because sitting there, you had no sense of scale to the size of those open panels mm -hmm. because you're so far away from them. Uh, and then lastly, this was my favorite picture, one of the touchdown points, right? Of what that... Uh, that looks like the Northeast. And, and one question I have there in closing is, I presume the canyons were created there to create that kind of bioswale? Uh, yes. Reservoir to handle it, you know, uh, students. One of the main things we have as a problem with uh, buildings is we're not the natural environment. So when we put concrete and black tops down, that's where water has issues. That's why you never hear of the forest flooding because it can't, it, everything just seeps in. But as soon as we put a surface down, you got water runoff and you have issues. So certainly what was a unique thing in this stadium is to have something so massive that all that water is running off of roofs and off of parking lots, where is it going? And so this landscaping is, is quite a thing. So to have these kind of bio swales, if you will, that can handle large amounts of water. And Steve mentioned the dry creek and stuff. That's exactly what it's for. So there'll be no flooding around, around this. So any other questions? I think I see one. Oh, one of the students said he's an architectural photographer. <laughs> one of my students. We'll have to talk about that. But um <laughs> wait, I was wondering something. So okay. uh the perforations on like the metal, was there like a pattern to it or was it just like at random? Because like to me it seemed like the the shadows almost seemed like clouds. Like, I don't know. That was just my Yeah, it, it's it's head. random. No, no. Two panels are alike. It's like a snowflake. Yeah, there was there was this uh, a JPEG image was created that just had this really um, random pattern on it, and, and the whole intent was of course variation, right? So that so that it didn't look very, uh, and then the perforations to, to look at make it look open. So yes, very random. 
like Steve said, no, 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 no one of those 30 something thousand panels is uh, alike. That's very interesting. Thank you. Sure. So any other other questions? Actually, uh, I was kind of uh, curious, uh, Ruben, in terms of your experience, when you sat in the seating, did it feel like you were under, underneath ground level or just because it was, it was so shaped? Like no, you, you're in the, you, you just feel like you're in the stadium. So if okay. I didn't know what was happening, you just feel like you're in the stadium because it's just a stadium sunk in. Actually, that brought me to a question. I know they must have some typology uh, experience being one that's gone to the Coliseum several times. Isn't part of that sunk in a little bit? Do you guys know? Uh, it's yeah, I yeah, think it is. It is. You have to walk down to walk down to the field. Right. So it's not the first time it's been done, but certainly it, you don't typically have it go down that far. Hundred hundred feet, guys, is feet. roughly ten stories. Right. If, ten if you guys 10. are ever on a flight coming in, um, I know in Southwest because it's on the the north flight path, you get a window seat on the left side of the plane. Uh, you can get a good a good view. I, I flew in when I was back east. I flew in over. The stadium, uh, the Chargers were playing Sunday night, and that that roof at ETFE was lit up like it was a video board. So it's it's really interesting to see. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't showing the game, but it was showing patterns uh, and and displaying something. Um, and it's it's really interesting to see at wow. night. And then, an, yeah. oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, as an architect, you know, each project takes years to kind of design and build, especially something as large scale as this. And, you know, uh, uh, designing something, you're looking at it in a 3D model, you're making small physical models out of it, hand sketches. And then to see it executed in reality is quite a treat. But in this case, when we did start construction, it took four months just to dig the hole. So it was like, you had to have a lot of patience to be able to wait for that uh, aha moment when you finally saw the architecture. And what some people may not realize is, of course, after digging the hole, that's when it finally decided to rain in LA. Right. <laughs> and that set the schedule back significantically, right? Because there was like just- by a year. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. like, well, guess we won't be playing football here this season because of just the bad timing. Uh, Mark, did I see you get ready to want to ask something? No? No, I'm fine. Thanks. OK. One thing I, I did want uh, um, the presenters to speak to a little bit, uh, because I could tell your paths were different. Um, and Steve started to focus um, on construction management to tell tell the students you know, about your educational path and when you had those aha moments into the specific things you wanted to do in architecture, I mean, architecture. <laughs> um, at Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, um, I, I, you know, as I indicated, I went to Illinois for um, construction um, management. Uh, construction management degree, uh, which was more on the, you know, the business and the money side. Um, and as I was taking the classes, I wasn't really enjoying them all that much. I took a construction management class and that's, that was the aha moment I had. But at, at the point I was in that uh, degree pursuit, I was not willing to, to change my, um, my career path uh, in terms of that particular degree. Um, once I got into school, I mean, I was I was a designer coming out of undergrad. Um, I won the the uh, senior design thesis award uh, the year I graduated, uh, with the intent of, you know, becoming a designer. And I got to I started working, and that wasn't 
what interested me. And I, and I think, you know, going back to what I said earlier about the students taking advantage of going to the field and watching construction as it, you know, as it progresses and not just waiting until the end. Um, I've always liked putting things together from what, since I was a little kid, I, I built models and tree houses and, you know, pick up a hammer and nail and, and pound a piece of wood together. But that, that's always been my kind of forte. And, and I think what I found as, as I progressed or started in, in architecture um, was that more of my interest was in the construction into things than the actual design process. Um, and I've been on the construction administration side probably almost the last 20 years. Um, so it's more than half of my, my career at this point. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's where I've been the whole time I've been at HKS is on in the construction administration side. Manzer on the other hand is the flip side, the design side. Yeah, my, my story is actually the opposite of Steve. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't know I wanted to become an architect. Yes, I, you know, uh, as, as uh, I, I was good at art, but I, it was never, never occurred to me. You know, I'm not one of those kids who was like, at five, I knew I wanted to be become an architect. I really didn't know what I wanted to do till like really late in high school. And when the pressure really mounted and I was like, I need to figure something out and I need to go somewhere. Uh, and, I, and I put thought to it. And eventually when I did decide to be an architect is a very single minded focus. It's like, I don't want to do anything else but architecture. And I'm sure um, any anyone who's in the architecture profession will tell you that um, we're here because we're passionate about it. And it's it's there's other professions that 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 have passion in it. But as architects, one of the unique things is that um, it's not a nine to five job. You, you love what you do. And, you know, that can't be said of all professions. Um, so um, if you love architecture, if you're in the architecture profession, considering architecture, um, know that one of the greatest things is your colleagues that you're working with are like you, they're passionate about it. And, and that's what makes it, that's what makes this profession fun. Yes, there's, there's the usual hardships and, you know, grunt work and all of that. But at the same time, each one of my colleagues here, each, each, each professional over here, I can guarantee without a doubt say that they all love this profession. There's, there's not a single person in the profession that's gonna be here because they don't like it and it's considered just to be a day-to-day -day job. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's about the people. Um, uh, and many, many times during this uh, presentation, we talked about you know, uh, collaborating with our consultants, with engineers. And as much as architecture is a profession about design, about building, it's also a profession where you have to collaborate with people. It's, a, it's, it's about relationships. It's about uh, coordinating and collaborating with other people and to, together as a team to build something amazing. So I, I, I hope all of you who, who, are, who are going down this path will, will definitely enjoy it and savor each and every moment of school, architecture school, and hopefully in the future in the profession as well. And networking and, and linking, meeting people such as these gentlemen, some of your faculty, um, uh, people at NOMA events, AIA events, all these different things are going to add to your life in the profession. So I, I always say, you know, there's a, there's a number of things. There's going to be things that enrich your life other things that are going to affect your life and there's going to be some life-changing people that uh that you come in contact with and there's probably a few of them in this in the zoom call right now so how those people affect you is going to be if you ever meet them and get involved hear their story learn from them check things out it's you'll be surprised is gentlemen about how many people worked on the project would you say how many architects roughly how many engineers and then just in general you know you have like you said so many folks well 
I, I can really only speak on the CA side. I'd be guessing if I if I tried to to give you a number on the design side, but the CA side, there were, I mean, on site every day, there were probably at least five of us, six of us. And CA folks, that's construction administration side right. of things. Construction administration. We handled the RFIs, the request for um, information that were brought up in the field, uh, reviewing submittals, and then uh, punch work and inspection work. And for a lot, for a lot of people, that's that's very exciting. People that do that, you know, often go from project to project and never very much go into offices. And no, I I I show up at the Christmas party and people wonder who I am. <laughs> I did that for a, a moment, two three years. I I worked on the UCLA Westwood replacement hospital and uh i was i was at perkins and will for oh about six years but those last two years i was i was never in office went to lunch with one of the one of my close friends that worked there and he saw this guy and it's like hey is that somebody you know from another office and no he works with us <laughs> and see, i never saw the guy well, that, that, that project <laughs> uh that i was working on prior to the stadium I think I was only in the office for the first year and then the rest of the time I was on the site. So people, if they, if they didn't get to know me in that first year, they didn't know me. So it just lends, it just shows that there's multiple things. There's architectural typology, meaning are you doing stadiums, uh, uh, arenas, theme parks, churches, schools, whatever. There's also the aspects of the profession, such as construction management, the design, the stuff in between, trying to get jobs, acquire jobs. So even saying an architect, that's just like saying anything else. I'm a football player. Really? Is it you're a kicker, a runner, quarterback, right. coach? What what are you? So lots of lots of things there. One Man, one last Go ahead. Manza, do you know how many people worked on the design? Yeah, I was I was just digging up some stats. I, I don't know the exact number of people. I know it was over uh, 50 people, uh, at just architects itself, that worked on it. Uh, we, I know stats for the hours. There were over 280,000 hours only from the architecture side that were put on this project, not including any engineers, consultants, or contractors, any of that. And that's a lot of hours. And as we know in 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 the workforce, there's 2,080 work hours, regular work hours for one person in a year, 2,000. <laughs> so that that accounts to a lot. One thing I'll, I'll I'll tell the people that are on here because I I live in Inglewood and have been here forever. Actually, even went to Inglewood High and all the way through, but have watched this, this project and the development of the site to give you an idea of scope. The stadium sits on, if not correct me folks, about 60 acres of land. Is that correct? Yeah, that sounds right. About right. And the Hollywood Park development is another 240 acres. Uh, so it just shows you the girth of that development. And there's certainly a paradigm shift because Staples Center or Crypto Center now it's getting ready to be called and Nokia Live was really kind of the sports hub of LA but now you have a major shift because the aging forum is there but now you have this major development with even a smaller multi-purpose space with it so now the shift is here NFL is having its offices here I've already heard I'm a major football fan, so I've already heard that the Heisman Trophy Awards is going to be at that small performing arts thing, stealing it away from Madison Square Garden in New York. So there's a major shift of what's going to happen on that site and in this location. And I think as students, you should really watch how that area starts to redevelop and change coming through Prairie and Crenshaw and, and all of that, you are getting ready to experience something 
that happens like once every 50 years or more right in your your backyard so pay attention to how those things roll out pretty interesting so if there aren't any other questions i know some some of the students have to go back to their classes I want to thank some of the professors for letting them come and see this i uh, hope everybody enjoyed it and um you know stay tuned next next semester we'll have other great lectures and things going. So please stay in tune with the El Camino Architecture Club. Thank you, Ruben. It was great. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. That was amazing. Thank you guys yeah, for having you. us. Yes, thank you for this opportunity. Our pleasure. All right. Yeah, thank you so Excellent. much, guys. All right. I will talk to everyone later. Bye, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Hi. Ruben. Hey. Thanks, How Ruben. you doing, Mitchell? You you're welcome, Mark. Uh, opportunity for students to visit the site. What do you think? Um kind of it's it's kind of tough. I am I'm about to Noma gave me the mission. And actually, I will stop the recording here.